Thank you. Welcome to our second in our series of wampum lectures. Uh, I'm David Martin, director of the Shinnecock Museum and uh, artistic director, curator. Um, the lecture series this afternoon is wampum and the Iroquois Confederacy and all other matters pertaining to wampum. Um, for those who may not be familiar, or this might be the first time that you've visited our museum, uh, we opened our doors in 2001, and we are the only Native American-owned and operated museum on Long Island. Um, the structure we're in is white pine logs, kind of come from upstate New York, and it's a very unique building, and we're very proud of it. Um, we're open pretty much year-round, except for January and February. So, uh, we, uh, you know, we try to do a little maintenance at that time, but we're open Thursday through Sunday about every week. Um, I'd like to bring your attention to, uh, <clears throat> this is Rosemary McKinley is here this afternoon. She uh, has written a publication entitled The Wampum Exchange. For those of you who might be interested, I believe she's in the next uh, wing over, in the east wing, with some of her books. Uh, you might like to check them out on the way out. Um, please um, look around, uh, make yourself to home while you're here, and hope you enjoy yourselves. <clears throat> our next major event coming up uh, this summer is our Strawberry Harvest Festival. Uh, that is on June 14, and uh, it'll be 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. here. Family fun for everyone, so we hope you can come back. We're going to have strawberry shortcake, traditional foods, a native artisan market. Uh, right now we're in the process of sprucing up our Wigan Living History Village, which is just east of the parking lot over, over there. That was something we were engaged with uh, for a couple of years. We received uh, federal grant funding to uh, reinvigorate some of our ancient traditions and get involved with uh, making traditional houses and everything you can imagine, dance performances. Uh, so if you'd like more information about any of our subsequent activities, uh, give us a call or inquire. Of, we have a table there on your way out with some literature. <coughs> uh, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Shane Weeks. He's one of our top uh, artisans of the Shinnecock Nation. I'm very fortunate to have him speaking this afternoon on wampum, uh, something that he knows very well. It's something that he's been engaged with for many years. Uh, he's been making wampum since 16 years of age. He's very engaged in it, uh, and he's one of our top contemporary artisans in any field, any media you can imagine. Uh, when we began our Living History Project two years ago, he was one of the top artisans. He can work in any media, stone, bone, leather, wood, he's a wood carver, he's, he's tremendous. He's a traditional singer and dancer. Um, you know, he, he's called upon to, to participate in many events, traditional events, ceremonials, you name it. So I'm very fortunate to have him this afternoon. <coughs> so with that, um, I'll, I'll give you Shane Weeks. Oh, I, I almost forgot to mention uh, those of you who might be aware of the Watermill Center over in Watermill, Shane is, is going to be attending a residency at the Watermill Center uh, this, uh, this year in May. And that's something that's tremendous, Robert Wilson of the Watermill Center. So we're very proud of Shane for attending that. So with that, let's give Shane a round of applause. Shane Week. Thank you, David. Um, hope everybody is having a good weekend, uh, good afternoon. My name is Shane Weeks. Um, I'm a lifelong Shinnecock member. Um, like David said, I've been doing wampum since I was 16 years old. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually 25 now. <laughs> so, no, not too, not too far away. <laughs> um, I started doing wampum, I learned wampum up here on the reservation. Uh, I was taught by a man from North Carolina who is, um, he was married in to our reservation, to one of our members. Uh, uh, he's from the Lumbee tribe. Um, when I was 16 years old, we, he just wanted to teach me. You know, I wanted to learn and he was there to teach me. Um, for 
for me, that was a very fortunate thing because not, not too many people around here do want them. There was, there's a few people, you know, three or four people, but I wasn't so, you know, I, did, I didn't know them too well. Um, so, year 2006, uh, we started in probably October, and we, he taught me how to cut wampum. We started in his backyard in the middle of winter, mind you, it was the middle of winter, and we set up a pop-up tent. And in the pop-up tent, we put a wood stove. And in that wood stove, you know, with that wood stove, it kept us warm throughout the whole time. And working with wampum, you have to, you need, we need water. Uh, and if you don't have water, the shell will break. Um, the shell is very fragile, it's like glass. It's, it's, it's made out of pure calcium. Um, so throughout, throughout that winter, we, he taught me how to carve off, and he taught me also how to carve deer antler. He taught me also how to carve wood. Um, we, we didn't specialize in the beads at the time. He, he didn't teach me how to carve beads. He taught me how to carve figures. You know, so we, we, we carved hearts, we carved eagles. One of the main things in, in Wampum, if you look, I'll actually show you a, uh, this is what a quahog shell looks like. This is one of the main sources of Wampum. There are other shells that are used throughout the country to make shell, shell beads and shell jewelry, but this is the main, the main source. Uh, you can only find this on the eastern coast, the northeastern coast of uh, the country. Um, it's very rare. The purple, the purple is actually what is the rarest because of how, how small it is in the shell. Most of the shell is white. Most of the little bit of the shell is purple. The eagles we would carve out of this would be the head. This would be one wing, and this would be the other wing. So we would sit there, and at the time, we were using Dremels. We were using a tool called a Dremel. If anybody knows, it's almost like a pencil, you know, but we would put a diamond bit blade at the end of it. And we would sit there and drip, we, we jerry-rigged a drip machine to drip water <laughs> on, on our tools while we were using it and just cut them off, you know. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no problem. Can we ask a question? Yeah, sure. sure. When, when you said you cut it, it actually would cut that. that, that it would cut right. And, and actually, diamond bit is the only bit that will cut this. Wow. Everything else will. We, we've tried everything else, and it'll just. It won't even cut it. It wow. won't even. It'll shatter it. It'll just well, get dull. How get, did they do it before then? How, the how, how they would do it before? Um, well. The traditional way of cutting wampum would be to break the shell up. First you'd break the shell up, and then you'd take a stone. Right. And in that stone you would, you would, you would carve a, a, a groove in it. A small groove about the diameter of the, um, of the bead mm -hmm. that you were making. You would put that in the water, in the puddle or you know whatever, whatever water source you had, and you would sit there and you would round it out. Wow. You would sit there and round it out. After that, you would take this tool right here. This tool is a drill. And you'd spin it. And this one actually isn't a working tool, but it's just here for, for props. And as you push it down, it would continue to spin. And you would sit there and drill it in the water. And yeah. Tedious. <laughs> Very tedious. And it hasn't, even though the tools we use today haven't gotten much better, um, after, after I was 16, and we worked at, uh, I worked with um, the guy from North Carolina, Lumpy. Uh We took our jewelry, we made jewelry out of our work. And we made necklaces, we made all sorts of different things. And we sold it. You know, we went around the local community, we went around uh, the local towns, and especially during Christmas time, because that's pretty much when we started. It was the middle of winter. Um, after that summer, that summer, I actually started uh, my own business and started traveling around uh, the, the tri-state area and Massachusetts to different powwows. Um, our powwow here is one of the biggest powwows on, on the East Coast. Uh, Labor Day weekend, Shinnecock Powwow is one of the biggest powwows on the East Coast, but it's not the only one. Many tribes around, around 
the country and Canada throw powwows almost every weekend. You know, they, it's continuous, and we call it the powwow trail, or just the trail. So uh, during during that summer, and we traveled, and we traveled uh, all over the place. You know, selling our wampum. We, we set up a, a vendor stand and a table, couple of tables, and we just sold. You know, we just sold our wampum. At the same time, back then, there weren't too many people doing wampum. You know, there was there was only a handful of people. I could probably count them on one hand around this area that were that were doing wampum. You know, uh, one guy was Andrew Hunter who passed away actually right as I started. Um, around that, I think that year he passed away. He was a Shinnecock man. Um, a couple of Eddie DeMolanta, who was the person who taught me. Uh, there was a couple of other people, but there weren't that many. And wampum was very scarce. You know. Um, there were there were a couple of counterfeits, counterfeit wampum makers out there that that were supposedly um, getting it made from across seas. You know, you send the shells across seas and they'd send you back beads. And a lot of people were were wary of of if the wampum was made authentic, or if the wampum was made uh, across seas, not by a Native American. So it was it was important for us to be out there and make sure that we explain to them that we are actually still doing it. You know, we are the ones still doing it, and it originated here, and we carry on that tradition. Um, but after after we that trail that time period, when I was 20 years old, I got a job working for the um, it's called Wampum Magic. And it's the biggest wampum manufacturer in the country, as far as I know. And it's run by the chief of the Uncatuck tribe in Mastic, New York, uh, live about a half hour away from here. Um, and we specialize in beads. Um, we specialize mainly in purple beads. Uh, like you said, it was a very tedious task. You know, making wampum is a very tedious task. When I first started there, This is a strand of wampum. When I first started there, it would take us a whole day to make this one strand. Wow. And in order to make this strand, we had to cut two strands. Because the other strand would break. <laughs> the other strand, we actually had, we had, after a few months of working there, we had a bucket. We call it the bowl of tears because it was, it was just you know, our heartbreak and everything, every time. And what we say is, it, when you're making wampum, when you're when you're crafting wampum, it comes from inside. You know, it comes from your heart. And if you if you're not feeling good, you shouldn't do it. You know, and that was that's how I got hired. That's that was like my you know one of the stipulations of how I got hired is you know if you're not feeling good, don't come to work. You know, it's it's and it's true. Um, while I was there, I worked with myself. It was myself, uh, a guy named Gnu, who's Ojibwe from Wisconsin. Um, he grew up here. It was another guy, uh, a good friend of mine from North Carolina, um, Lumbee, again. Um, he worked there, and an Uncacha guy uh, named Mike, he worked with us. And every one of them would tell you, if you're not feeling good, everything breaks. You, you break everything. Machines will go down, everything, you know, every, everything possible will go bad. Um, but as we, as we progressed, we got better. You know, we got we got a lot better, and um, I was one of the first people. Gadu was the first person there. I was the second person hired, and then after that, it is uh, Steve and Mike. Um, as we progressed towards the end of, I stopped working there as a wampum maker, probably two years ago, and uh, <coughs> by that time, I could cut, I could cut drill and have it in the polisher in an hour, one strand. <laughs> and it, 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 most of us could do it, you know. It, we got, we got, but we were in there, you know, eight hours a day. Wow. You know, we were in there eight hours a day and we just, by the end of the, by, by that time we were producing like 10 strands per person a week, wow. you know, of, of purple. Wow. Um, we had tons of shells. You know, the shells we, we collected were from not only local shells, but they were, uh, we, we would communicate with the local fishermen, and they would just give us totes and totes of shells. Um, 
we had like tractor trailer full of the shells, <laughs> you know. And once we ran out of one track, we actually ran out of one tractor trailer worth of shells, and I think it was like two years. And it had to. I think they're almost done with that second one now. Um, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it was a lot of work, you know. And because of how rare it is, to get to get a purple bead, you can only use this part of the shell. You can only use this part of the shell. In this shell, you probably I could probably get eight beads out of this shell. Maybe, yeah, probably eight beads out of this shell. And you know that's a lot. It's it's, it's a lot. That's a good shell. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a bad shell. <laughs> this is this is most of the shells. If let's say we had a crate of shells, maybe you know a three foot by a tote of shells. That out of that tote of shells, we would probably get eight that are workable. You know the rest of the shells we would either um, throw back into the water, which would also create. Um, uh, you put shells in the water to, to have a uh, oyster bed, you know, algae and all sorts of things attached to, it's like a reef, you make your own reef, okay. you know, um, so we put it back into the water to give back, and the rest of them we cut up, you know, uh, when I started working there, Harry had already had a crew, he's the chief of um, Puspita, uh, Harry had already had a crew working there several years before that, uh, the first crew, and they they cut white bees, everything, you know, they cut a lot of everything, and when they left, he had so much stock of, of white bees, he only wanted us to specialize in purple bees, you know, so we, we specialize in purple bees, and that's that's how uh, how that came about. Um, another thing that they used to cut is a whelk shell. that way. But <laughs> it was a whelk shell. And the actual only part you can cut is this middle part, the spiral that's in there. Because that's, that's the thickest part. So you would, cut, you would shatter all this away and cut that middle part into slices. And that's, that's a whelk shell. And it comes out kind of like that peachy color there. Um, you would make these for that? Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, this is a, a white strand. This is made out of quahog, but the white part. Um, another shell, this is more of a contemporary use, is a conch shell. Because traditionally we didn't have these around here. You know, um, all these shells, we cut them now and they're extremely hard to cut. They're extremely tough, they're extremely brittle. And I got this one from uh, Key West. When I traveled down to Key West, I got this from Key West, but uh, they're, they're rare. They're really rare to come about to, you know, people. That takes you so long to make those purple beads. How much can you sell um, in this one? Um, well, at, at one point, at when we first started out, this strand would cost you $200, you know, just for this one strand. A white strand like this would cost you around 60 or $75. You know, it's, it's it, even traditionally, even back in the day, the white strands were twice as less as a purple strand. The, the, I think, um, excuse me, I think the the price of a white strand was nine pence back in the day, and and I think the, um, it was a shilling and like seven pence or something like that for a purple strand. So it was almost over twice that much, even when the colonists came here. Um, so. As, as, after I stopped working there, um, I actually took up a job here, helping the museum with, with the living village, the Wiccan living village. And we created, I don't know if you, if you went out there, we created the longhouse and the w wiki up that's out there, um, the garden that's out there, and that took us several weeks to do. Um, but I worked here part time on the weekdays. On the weekends, I actually, went back on the power trail, started up another business and went back on the power trail. And this time we traveled all the way from Canada, Ottawa, Akwesasne, all the way down to North Carolina, the Lumbee Reservation. Uh, they don't have a reservation, but Lumbee Territory. And um, 
uh, sold wampum. I also sold a lot of Native American artists up here work. You know, it was it was rough times. To, you know, work we were working here part time. So a lot of the museum, the people that worked here at the museum, were also artisans. You know, they were also artists, and we all needed to you know have something in our pocket to keep going. So I took their work and sold it on the trail. You know, um, it was another way to keep the community involved. You know, for me. Just because I like to see the community moving, you know, um, and to be able to bring stuff back, you know, you go on the trail, and whoever you meet, you meet people from all over the world, you know, all over the country, all different reservations, all different types of people, and they all teach you something, you know, they'll tell you something that you've never heard before because you've never been there before. Um, so. One of my biggest goals was to just get us out there, you know, get Shinnecock out there to also teach them, you know, to show them because a lot of people don't know that we're still here. You know, a lot of people still don't, or they know that we're here and just have never met us, you know, or anything like that. Actually, um, the Iroquois, you know, one of the Iroquois uh, tribes is the Mohawk. Um, I know a few people up in the St. Regis Reservation, Akwesasne, it's on the border of Canada and uh, New York. Actually, if you want to be on map. Where's Canada? Um, I guess this is Canada? Yeah. So this would be the Mohawk. St. Regis Reservation is right here. Right there in the middle, and there's no border. You 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 can be you one step you're in Canada, one step you're in New York, and um, that was pretty crazy. But when I when I went up there and I took the wampum up there, a lot of the elder people they looked at it and they would say, "Wow, is that real wampum? You know, is, it, is this real?" And I'd say, "Yes." You know, they'd be like, "Wow, you know, I haven't seen that in, in years. I haven't seen that in, in so long." A lot of the younger people didn't know what it was. You know, because it's it's. Even though it's it's a traditional um, sacred traditional piece in Mohawk culture, the origins of where they got it from isn't really known. You know, I've heard stories and read things where it was. I'll get more into him later, but Hiawatha, um, who actually created that belt right there, but he was. They say that he found the wampum. He was traveling and he ran across a puddle. I mean, a pond and that pond was covered in ducks and he was trying to find a way across it he didn't know a way across it and finally the ducks lifted and in the middle of that um, pond was a, a a walkway made out of shells now that could be a literal term it could be it could mean he traveled all the way somewhere to a salt water because quahog shells only come as far as i know salt water you know up there there's no there's no salt water so it had to come from the shoreline um, so he either walked all the way out here, um, found some shells and brought it back, or it's possible that some people from out here took the shells out there and maybe had a community, an old community, and left the shells there, you know, and he just stumbled across this, this pond with all these shells there. Just how, we, just how we were dumping shells into the water, maybe so were they. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, but a lot of a lot of the people in Akwesasne, they just didn't know. You know, the the, the elders, they, they knew a little bit, um, but it was good to bring it back. You know, they all said they were all saying, you know, it's good to see it come back. You know, and I, I was up there with Hanks. You know, Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was good. Sure. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I read a book that was called Native New Yorkers. Okay. I forget the author at the time, and he was saying. Uh, Basically, it was a history of, of the Delawares right, on the right. East Coast. And he had a couple of chapters on Long Island right. and the Long Island tribes. But he, he, he said that uh, just prior, and not prior maybe for a century or so, prior to the European coming mm -hmm. into the Americas, that uh, Wampum had begun to travel in the sense that uh, trade routes had begun to open between the different tribes from the coast inland, and that Wampum actually was traded along these trade routes and they it went as far west as Michigan. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a developing uh, a trading system yes. among yeah. the tribes. Uh, yeah. And that's how it might have gone west. Yeah, it actually, it actually went farther than that. Um, 
I think there are some stories that show off them in like Arizona, Nevada, and um, if you can imagine back in the day, uh, the territories were, were set up a little different. If you can look here, uh, this is a map of the five nations and their surrounding territories and neighbors. You have the Mohawks, the Oneidas, the Onondagas, the Cayuga, the Senecas, and the Wenro. These are all Iroquois, Susquehanna, Eries. These are Iroquois, right here. Over here, on the bottom, you have Delawares. Uh, they're Algonquin. Up here, you have another Algonquin band. That right in, right in here is another Algonquin band. Um, the difference between all of these people was mainly uh, language dialect. Um, the biggest difference in culture was between the Iroquois and the Algonquins. The Iroquois had a completely different culture and belief system than the Algonquins did. Um, but it wasn't such a small community. You know, if you can imagine, all, the, all of this area, Massachusetts, Vermont, Maine, all of this was one people. You know, they all, we spoke different dialects. It was like a slang, you know, you go up, up to Massachusetts, they talk, you know, with that Boston accent. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a different dialect, but we all understood. You know, you could travel. And there are stories of Native Americans being able to run 100 miles in less than a day. Wow. You know, so, so you'd be able to travel Long Island in less than a day. You know, we didn't have horses. There was, there was nothing to ride, you know, maybe a deer, but I doubt, you know, they would ride. <laughs> um, there, were, there were small ponies out in, in the Plains lands, you know, back then, but before that there were no horses, so everything was done on foot. Um, you know, I've also heard stories, you could, they would send up smoke signals on Long Island here, and there were 13 different tribes on Long Island, and they would send up smoke signals, and within a couple of hours, all those tribes could get together for whatever they needed to do, whether it was go to war or anything, but it could, the whole island could, could come together in a matter of hours off of smoke signals. Um, <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't such a, such a impossible thing for it to travel as far as it did. Um, for instance, there are stories of how the Iroquois got their wampum um, that we carry, that are, that's in our traditions of Long, on Long Island, and how during contact, uh, the settlers uh, documented how the Delawares, mostly towards the city area, were, were um, they called it paying tribute um, to the Iroquois. And they would make the wampum and ship it up to Hudson. You know, so the waterways is definitely a way of getting getting sources around, resources around. Um, back to Hiawatha. When this belt over here is the treaty belt, not originally between the United States and the Iroquois, but between the Iroquois nations themselves. Um, before, before the Five Nations came together, they were war, they were war. You know, they were, the Iroquois were like a fierce tribe, you know, they, they had stories and history that, that they just war with everybody. They, just, they were cannibals, they went to war, you know, they, they did a whole lot. And this man named Hiawatha, um, uh, he was kind of an apprentice of a guy named, uh, I can't remember his name, right? Dagon something. But he was uh, the great peacemaker of the, Iro of, of the Iroquois tribe, one of the Iroquois tribe. And again, these, these, these are our stories. Before I start, let me, before I start with this story. Traditionally, our, our history is, is told orally. We didn't have oral tradition, I mean a uh, written tradition. We didn't have a written history. So everything is oral. Um, I would think that's to show more value, 
you know, if you if you if you get say it to somebody orally, it it's it becomes a part of your life. You know, if you if you talk about it orally, it becomes a way of living. You know, you, it's 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 how you move. It's hard to explain, but that's it's it's how it is. And so a lot of the stories, you know, you have you have your written history that is written in the eyes of the colonists. And then you have your traditional history that doesn't get talked much because it's it's not it's not written, you know. So you can you can go to a different tribe and they'll tell you a whole bunch of history that's just not written. Um, for instance, uh, when I was 19, I went out to Wisconsin. Um, I was in, I was a part of a group that uh, we traveled to Wisconsin to Medewin ceremonies and the Anishinaabe people, the Ojibwe's, and. Um, out there, they carry they carry stories that are older than America. You know, they they carry stories that are older than America, and um, part of their story shows how they. It's called the Seven Fires Pro Seven Fires Prophecy, and part of that story shows how they were originally um, a part of the Algonquin people on the East Coast. Uh, somebody had a prophecy, and when. Uh, that prophecy came out. It was said that the first, uh, the first fire, the seven fires, the first fire said that the colonists were coming, and that our, our people would be destroyed if they did not move. So the the Ojibwe's, the Anishinaabe, moved, and it, the first fire shows how it was a huge migration of of people that went from the east coast to the west coast, um, not the west coast to the western. Um, around the Great Lakes area. And the second part of the fire shows how us, the eastern side of the people, would have to fight off the colonists, or at least delay it. You know, at least delay the decay of our culture. Um, the next fire shows how, how our people would lose our culture. You know, our people would lose our culture. And um, it would be a time of materialism, materialism that takes takes place of spiritualism, and um, after that, it was said that the people would try and bring that culture back. After after the people of the East Coast would try and bring that culture back, but the world was simply not ready. You know, the world wasn't ready to take on to to, to accept that, so they would fail. After that, it was said the youth would be the people to go back and and search for that history. And it said that the Anishinaabe people, because they moved, the Medewin Lodge, the Medewin people, because they moved and delayed their, their decay of their culture, hold those stories for us. So that when we come back and ask them questions, they will be able to teach us and bring it back to our people. And the youth will be eventually the people to bring it back and the, the, the life would again go in full circle, which is also, you know, a part of our culture. Everything goes in full circle. Wow. Um, yeah. But, um, so, you, you know, you never, it's, when you're talking about the history of our people, you have, usually have more than one side. You know, you usually have the colonist side, the written history, and then you have the oral tradition, which doesn't get, get far. You know, it, it's usually kept between, between native communities. Um, so, Hiawatha was, I, they say he was an Onondaga man. He was either Onondaga or or Oneida. I'm not really sure. They probably nobody's really sure. He wanted to unite all of the Iroquois tribes because they were warring so much against each other, and they just didn't. You know, he didn't want this to happen anymore. Um, so he went around Oneida, uh, Cayuga, Seneca, Onondaga, and he talked to all the chiefs of all these tribes. And most of them were on board, um, except for the Anadagas. The Anadagas uh, chief, whose name was Tadaho, Tadaho, um, he uh, he just a war guy. You know, he just wanted war. But eventually, they they convinced him to join the Confederacy. And that's where you have this belt here. And this this belt is actually pre-contact. You know, they don't they haven't dated it yet. Some say it was around eleven. 1100, uh, some say it was like 1450, but it was somewhere before pre-contact. If you would talk to a Native American, they'd probably say it was way farther than that. 
Um, but what this what this belt represents is the middle, what looks like a tree or an arrowhead, is actually representing a uh, representation of the uh, Onondaga tribe, and that was because that was the main tribe in the middle. You know, if you see Onondaga's in the middle, the belt is red from right to left. Belts are red from right to left. So the one on the on the right represents the Mohawk. The one on the left, uh, further in it, is Oneida. The middle is Onondaga. The, the next one is Cayuga, and the first one is Seneca. The the two little um, lines on the end of each side of that are, is for to allow people to join their confederacy. It's to allow people to you know it, 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 to build. Um, in, I want to say in 1700, 1722, um, the Tuscarora tribe joined the Confederacy. Uh, so they became the sixth um, tribe of the Confederacy. Um, it's also said, uh, off topic, but the Mohawks also migrated. The Mohawks, the Iroquois, were either originally further north or further south. And story, most of the stories I've seen or heard say that they traveled from the north, the northern lands, around the St. Lawrence, and then moved down towards uh, Lindell Lakes. And then after the colonists, they even moved further and started warring with other tribes, Sioux tribes, and, and all the way to Mississippi. Um, but as, as Hiawatha, uh, put this confederacy together it was known as the great law of peace you know it was it was the great law of peace and that I have, let's see, yeah philosophy religion and government would all be one thing you know it was, it's not separated it's all one thing and um, as the colonists came they would see how how organized it was. You know, they saw how organized it was, and they, um, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> they, they wanted to, to try and do something with them. Um, one of the, uh, the people that helped with the Constitution, Benjamin Franklin, um, his good friend, his name was Conrad uh, Wise, Weezer or something like that. Um, he, uh, Conrad Wise was, a, he was adopted into uh, one of the Iroquois tribes, and he sat there and recorded a lot of what was going on with the Iroquois tribes. So when Benjamin Franklin came about, he he talked with Conrad and wanted to try and put that, incorporate that into the Constitution. Um, so that's where they say a lot of the Constitution comes from. It also, again, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to um, a lot of colonial historians, they might say, you know, it was never based off the, off the Iroquois Confederacy or anything like that. But the Iroquois, a part of the history, says that it did. You know, that those things took place and this is how, how it happened. Um, another... Where's my tech guy? <laughs> I have a question. Yep. Who was the um, head for this over the century? Um, it's actually held in Canada right now um, by one of the reservations. Um, I forget. Is it? Uh, what is the reservation? I, I forget what the actual is. I forget what it is. And I've actually been there. I just can't even <laughs> remember what it is. Um, two or one? Two or one? Yeah, okay. So this was another um, wampum belt that was, it was a, a representation of a treaty between the Iroquois and the Dutch. Um, now wampum belts weren't only just there to just be there, you know. They were there as a significant, to, to hold memory. You know, they were there to hold memory and to, so that you would remember what took place and what it stands for. Now this, this belt here, just like uh, the Hiawatha belt, shows memory where you have the Iroquois, 
and the Dutch. These two lines, they look black, but they're supposed to be purple. And they would be purple, and they represent two brothers or two courses of life that travel next to each other. You know, instead of, instead of warring against each other, they, they show brotherhood. And um, the white symbolizes peace, forgiveness, and, and you know, just good, good things, good thoughts. Um, but just, yeah. Uh, as this belt was was put, it's, it was said by the Iroquois person, "You say you are our father, and I am your son. We say we we'll, we will not be like father and son, but like brothers." And that that was the basically the meaning of this of this uh, belt to hold that tree, yeah. So like, wampum was used in a couple different ways, right? Some as money and some as picturing events right. and things like that? Well, wampum, um, wampum wasn't actually used as a currency until colonists came. Um, when colonists came, the colonists saw how, how the wampum was traded and capitalized, you know, they capitalized off of it. And so they, would, they actually set up wampum factories all around the East Coast. Um, one of the wampum factories that I know about is called the um, Campbell Wampum Factory, which was in New Jersey, uh, run by the Delawares. And that ran from the late 1700s all the way into the 1800s and um, produced wampum that whole time. So wampum was used to record the history? Yes. Okay. Wampum was used to record history, traditionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did both men and women um, were, women, were women a part of it? Yes, yes. I'm sure. You know, women, women were a big part of jewelry making. They were a big part of, of, of the community. Um, women back then, you would have your chief, and then you would have your sunk squad, which would be the, the, the queen, basically. But the queen or the, the sunk squad would, would make a lot of decisions above the chief. You know, the, tri the tribe would consult the council. The council would consult the chief. The chief would consult the the sun school. Like <laughs> 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 <Right> today. <laughs> right today. Exactly. Right. Just, just how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> but um. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't used as as currency until until Europeans came, until the colonists first came. Um, both men and women did did use it, um, but it was it was mainly used traditionally as a record keeper. You know, as something not only as a record keeper between treaties, but say I was a messenger and I had to carry carry a letter from a chief to a chief. I would carry a wampum belt authorizing that I could bring that letter to somebody. You know, so it was also used as a badge or just, just a way of, of describing something yourself, describing a pact between people, um, to tell the story. Um, kind of like a receipt. Kind of like a receipt, exactly. Oh, uh, from last week's uh, lecture, um, I understand that Mr. Martin did this beautiful yes, yep. piece up there, and that the white area above the two people are, he was the chief, and that was his. Right. Sunspot. Sunspot. Yeah. Uh, that is the yeah. wampum belt. Above it, yes. Yes. Does that have a particular. Um, I'm not sure what that belt means. Um, there are, there are um, as far as I know, about 20 belts that I know. Um, I know there are like 13 Iroquois belts, but I'm sure there, there are other belts and there are definitely belts that have been lost in history. Who um, keeps the belts? Uh, either different tribes or museums. Some of the belts are held in museums. No, I mean back in the history when they were passed. Oh, when they were passed, it yeah. would be the chief. It would be the chief did, of the tribe. Did they pass it to one tribe to another? Oh, um, no. No, no. If, it, if it was, if, it depends on what it was for. If it was for a treaty, a pact between two tribes, it would be held by whoever that pact is between. If it was something like a badge for a person um, to say, me give a messenger, uh, 
they would have personally have that belt and would probably be the only person authorized to carry that belt. You know, um, they they also say as as people got older, they were and more skilled in their in their communities. They were taught how to read that belt, so it was a process. You know, just like when we went to a gym, um, Wisconsin, how they how they teach is in is in levels. You know, you become a part of this lodge and they teach you in levels. You know, first you first you learn the basics and then it gets further and further and further. And the history they have, they have a um, a scroll that's that's over 600 years old. That's still that's still there today. You know that they still ha carry today. That shows the migration. You know of that that depicts in pictures the migration of of, of the the Ojibwe from East Coast to West Coast. I have another question mm -hmm. about making a a belt like that. Is, is that your and on a It would be like a loom, yes. Just like a loom, yeah. And it is like a loom. Mm -hmm. Exactly like a loom. That's exactly how, it, how it's made. Um, if you can see, each it, it's each bead is facing up. You know, the, the lines go like this. Yeah. Right. Oh, okay. You know, and I believe there's 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 38 rows on that, on that belt right there. Um, and Few thousand beads. I think it's like six thousand beads. That's on that belt. Uh, most of them are purple. I think five thousand something of them are purple. Another couple hundred were are white. You know. Um, another way. Uh, this was actually a gift from my mother. <laughs> I had bought her. I didn't make this one, but somebody from here did make this. Um, this is kind of contemporary. If you can see in there, these are Swarovski crystals. Um, the white hair pipes are made of bone, and if you can see closely, there are, are uh, purple pearls. Not pearls, but they're just round beads, yeah, yeah. you know. And this is, it's a choker, you know. So this is another another contemporary use of it. Yeah. Um, feather's just metal. Yeah, I think it is sterling. Yeah, I do see the uh, mark back there. Um, where am I at? Yeah, so, I don't know, like, like I was saying, it, it's, it's taught in levels. So as, as you grow up, you will learn more and more and more. And as part of those teachings, you're taught to give back. You know, you, you're taught to, to, to learn these things and then bring it back to commu your community or your people. And, you know, that's one of the things I focused on was to be able to bring these the teachings, as we call them, back to our community and to be able to encourage our people, you know, here in Shinnecott because throughout history, a lot of our culture has been oppressed and has been lost or, or um, looked over, you know, and Back in the day, it was our tribes were very close with the surrounding tribes um, up in uh, Pequot, up in Rhode Island, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, the Wampanoags. Um, recently, I actually just made a trip last year up to um, Passamaquoddy Reservation in Maine, and they actually had stories of Long Island. You know, they had stories of how. They would canoe all the way down to Long Island, and they just remember they have stories of a big, big island, you know. <laughs> so obviously, you know, we're the only biggest island out here. But for for those of you who who were here last um, last week, uh, Gerard mentioned something about uh, paddle journeys, and paddle journeys are still done today, and um, they span hundreds of miles. You know, it's mostly done on the West Coast where people from Alaska, tribes all along the coast would gather up and paddle all the way down to a host community, a host reservation or a host tribe, and they paddle all the way down and at the end of that it would be thousands of people, you know, thousands of people. He said it was like 90 something canoes, you know, huge canoes with, with like two dozen or a dozen people in each canoe and they would just travel down. 
and on Arcos, we had the same stories. You know, the Passamaquoddy still have those same stories. Um, traditionally, our tribe were whalers. You know, traditionally, we would go out miles, and there's stories that, that say we would go out miles and, and kill whale and bring it back for our people. Um, you know, a whale would last the, probably the whole winter, you know. If, if you would get a whale in the beginning of winter, it would last the whole winter. Um, I remember reading this one story of a uh, tribe members from here um, paddled out, uh, I think they were out there like 10 or 15 miles, and um, just chasing this whale. You know, and the whole crew, they, they finally got this whale. It took them 10 hours to get back in halfway. You know, so after 10 hours, they were only seven miles in dragging this whale. And it's recorded that, that tribe members from here actually went out there, um, gave them food, gave them water, and helped them paddle it all the way back in the rest of the way. You know, so in terms of traveling and how far things are, you know, that gives you another sense of how how things are actually closer than they seem, you know. Um, he was also, Roddy also mentioned last week how uh, a couple years ago, uh, we actually start, uh, had our own paddle journey. And I, I, unfortunately I wasn't a part of that, but um, I'm trying to be a part of it this year. Um, and we started over Peconic Bay. They started over Peconic Bay and went all the way from Peconic to Orient Point, and then from Orient Point, across the sound. And then from the sound, they went all the way up one of the rivers and finally met in um, Mohegan territory up in uh, Connecticut. You know, so I, I don't remember how long he said that took, but um, it took a while. Yeah, I'm sure, it took, I'm sure it took a while, you know. Were they canoes or kayaks? Canoes, yeah. yeah. And they have, um, they have big canoes, you know. They, it kind of looks like, the, if you look at that mural back there, that's kind of what they look like. Yeah. And actually here, uh, when I was working here, we actually made a dugout canoe. Um, we, we use a little power tools, but the traditional way of making a canoe is you would burn it. You would take a whole tree, and on the top of it, you just lay ashes. I mean, not ashes, um, coals, hot coals. And as those coals burn, you just scrape it all away and just keep putting more coals and you wet the sides so that it, you know, it keeps the sides from burning through. And we did that, you know, we did that and out of a white pine tree. And um, at the end of that, we finally put it in the water, you know. And the first time we put it in the water, that was the first time I ever flipped a canoe. <laughs> it was so off balance, he just didn't even... Because <laughs> apparently you're supposed to have a rock in there. You know, you're supposed to have a rock in there as a like, ballast. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, um... Uh, yeah, we, we put it in the water and flipped right as soon as we got it. <laughs> so we, we had to reposition ourselves. I had to sit in the back. Um, <laughs> And uh, we finally made it out there, and you know it worked. Um, but uh, for for us traveling, traveling was wasn't as hard as it is today. You know, you didn't need a car. You didn't. You just went. You know, you just you just went wherever you had to go. And um, uh, you know, there was, it wasn't that limiting. It wasn't as limiting as it is today. Um, for me, I still try and do that, you know, even as limiting as it is, I still try and travel and, and to be able to take these stories and, and bring them back, and, you know, and try and teach it. And uh, for me, that's what it's all about, you know, education, knowledge, you know, that's really the key, and, and growth, you know. Do you live here? Yes, yeah. Did you go to school here? Yep. Yeah. I lived here all my life. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what time is it? That time? Oh, it is great. Um, if anybody has any other questions, um, yeah, yeah. What part of North Carolina? North Carolina, Lumberton. Right about, um, right, right about Lumberton, Red Springs area. Well, there's a lot of um, Lumbies down there. You know, I think their 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 tally is like twenty thousand people. They, how many people live down there? They don't have a reservation though, um, like we do. They just live there in North Carolina. 
you know. Um, Equisau the same thing. They have like 20,000 people living on the reservation, you know, and it's huge. Their reservation is, is huge. You know, you, it's across with the St. Lawrence. It's on both sides of the St. Lawrence River. Um, before, before I go, one, one. The one tribe you said in North Carolina that doesn't have a reservation, do they all live like in a localized area at all, or is it? Um, they do live in a localized area. Um, there are other people living there, mm -hmm. but I mean, that area is huge. <coughs> you know, that, that area spans miles. Wow. You know. um, another tribe, before I go, I traveled to uh, a reservation called Kawawa Chickama. Um, that reservation is it's the Inu people. Um, in northern Quebec, in a place called Shefferville, a town called Shefferville. Um, to get there, we tr we drove all the way up the St. Lawrence River to a place called Satil. And in Satil, uh, the road ends. You know, that's pretty much the end of the road before it gets barren. Um, from there, you take a 14-hour train ride into the middle of nowhere. And you know, that's what I say. It's like the middle of nowhere because you know, on either side, there's no civilization. There's no roads. The only way to get up there is either train or plane. That's the, those are the only two ways to get up there. Yeah. And, um, and uh, when we got up there, um, the, people, the people in Satil spoke French and their native language. You know, so we had, it was kind of like the language barrier for us because we don't speak, I don't speak any French. You know, and so we had to, we had to kind of talk to them in a way, some, some, there was this one woman there, she spoke a little bit of English, so she kind of interpreted for us. And once we got on the train, we met the, the other tribe. Um, they spoke their native language in English, you know, and that's the tribe we stayed with. We stayed up there for, I think it was like 11 days or something like that. And um, I actually went up there with Roddy. Uh, he was trustee at the time and had invited me to go up there with him. And the people there, it was under a century ago that they were still in the bush, you know, as they call it. They were they were they pre-contact, you know. So I talked to a lot of a lot of the elder people there, and I a lot of the um, who were kids at the time, a lot of people who were kids at the time who remember being taken out of the bush, you know. And they there's a lot of them just they don't like to talk about it, but they were taken out of the bush and and they were put into schools and put into churches and put in you know told not to 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 practice their culture, mm -hmm. and a lot of them are still don't like to practice their culture today, you know, but it's coming back, you know, when we went up there, we were actually asked, we were actually asked to build them a sweat lodge, you know, one of the, one of the people that we were staying with, he asked us to build a sweat lodge for him, and we did, and we did ceremonies there, you know, and I don't know if that was one of the first, you know, but I know that it's, it's, it's an upcoming thing, um, uh, recently he just, he contacted me and told me that it's still in use, you know, that it's, he's still using it. But um, I, I got a chance to fish, uh, to go out on a boat with one of the elders and fish with him, you know, and he would just say, he was saying mainly um, about global warming, you know, and how, how real of a problem, you, you can call it global warming, you can call it the, the earth rotated on an axis, whatever you want to call it, but for them it's a real problem. Um, we actually went up there, I try, we tried to go up there and hunt caribou, and the caribou herds at a certain time of year would come down and tra travel through their lands. Uh, that year, it was, it was too warm. You know, when, when we got up there, it was like 70 degrees. You know, it was like 70 degrees, the flies were out. Two days later, it was a blizzard. You know, it was, it was the craziest thing ever. It was, just, it was just a complete blizzard, and I was the first to know. Is, is the traditional way of life being practiced here on the reservation? Um, do some, do some. Um, for us, for us, it's traditional means family. You know what I mean? For us, traditional means family. And as long as we have our family here together, that's traditional for us. You know. Yeah. How many people here? Um, I think there's 700 people living here, and there's about 15 to 1600 people in the enrollment. Um, Charlie. That pertains to what you've been talking about. A different question. Uh, did the, the pre-contact natives have any use of metals at all? Or well, I'm not sure actually if they did now, but now they actually 
own mining companies and have contracts all over the, uh, all over the world with Japan and other countries. And um, a lot of their lands are, are mining now. And well, yeah, did, yeah. did the makers of these belts, for instance, uh, have no? There was no metal. No metal. No, metal. no, metal. no, no, no. It, was all, it was all stone. It was all stone. It was all stone, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if you want to mention it, but what are you going to do with your watermill residency? Oh, um, the watermill residency <laughs> um, is actually, we're doing a project on the history of Shinnecock. And um, what, what we're going to do is go around and try and get interviews from our elders, our youth, and just, just to have a documentation of life on the reservation. You know, I'm not sure if that's ever been done up here. As far as I know, it hasn't. But it's, we're, we're just trying to show that, you know, and get, get everybody on film and to document that. You know, so hopefully, hopefully it'll go again. Any other? My time up is. Thank you.